Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us for our COVID talk this morning and for the people watching the recording at home. Uh, my name's Yi, I'm one of the UCSF residents and very excited to introduce uh, one of our own attendings this morning, Dr. Thomas Chi, um, who is one of our endourology attendings and he's gonna be speaking about uh, ultrasound PCNL. Um, so, Dr. Chi. Thanks so much, Yi. Uh, so I appreciate everybody kind of joining in today. I know uh, as, as clinical services have ramped up, uh, folks have a lot more to balance. So uh, hopefully you'll take away from here something that's uh, good for your education and also have a chance to kind of pass it on and, and review it later. Uh, Yi's one of our terrific residents who's going into uh, pediatrics with a focus on stones. So we're excited to have him moderate today. So I, I'm an endourologist here at UCSF. Uh, we have been doing a lot of work in trying to change the way that we do PCNL. Um, both here locally and across the country and now around the world really. And uh, so I'm gonna kind of tell you about some of the work that we've been doing and why my argument would be that ultrasound is a better approach than fluoroscopy for PCNL. So uh, my goal is to kind of walk us through uh, a couple of different phases of the talk. First, I'll start with my disclosures. I do have some uh, advising and consultation uh, work with a bunch of different companies. And for some of the ultrasound work that we've done, we have uh, created a, a device company um, for a new sheath. Uh, but none of the talk today is really centered around any of these this, um, type of disclosures. My goal is to hopefully have you understand the technical uh, steps that you actually need if you wanted to do this in your practice. Uh, so if you're a trainee, you can go back to your attendings and say, hey, this is an idea. Maybe we should try this. Uh, and also gain familiar with some of the advantages that exist for ultrasound compared to fluoroscopy. And you'll see from this talk that, you know, I'm obviously a little biased towards ultrasound, but there are, there are some advantages and, and kind of equivalencies. So the talk's going to go by first giving you the argument, you know, why should we even be thinking about ultrasound in percutaneous stone surgery? And then to show you hopefully that it's achievable, we'll talk to some technical steps, and then uh, I'll end on kind of talking about some of the impact of ultrasound use. If we have time for it, we'll talk about both the dilation and the access, but most of the talk is going to really be focusing on the access. How do you get in the kidney with ultrasound? So the first argument I make is that, you know, most people ask, well, what are we doing with ultrasound here? What, what are we doing with PCNL, even in the whole world? And if you're from a program that you don't do very much ultrasound for access into the kidney, most places are like that. So most of the time we've been taught traditionally to use fluoroscopy for accessing the kidney for surgical removal of stones. And so when you think about the world, this is like 15 years ago, uh, folks that were publishing on the use of ultrasound really came from a couple of pockets amongst urologists. So Asia, uh, South Asia, a little part of the Middle East, some parts of Europe. Uh, and so from a urologist perspective, we've always thought, well, fluoroscopy is just the way that we get into the kidney. So everybody kind of does it in a similar way with different variations, but fluoroscopy is the way of the world. But when you actually think about the number of needles that go into the kidney, the majority of them are not actually done by urologists. If any of you guys have ever been down into, a, uh, into an interventional radiology suite, if they're getting access for you or if they're putting a nephrostomy tube into a kidney, the vast majority of the interventional radiologists use ultrasound because they don't have cystoscopes and they can't intubate the ureters and put contrast in the collecting system. So the vast majority use ultrasound. And so when you actually think about the world from the perspective of who's putting needles into the kidney, the world is really about ultrasound. And so I'd make the argument that I think that we have missed the boat for a really long time. And we are not worse interventionalists than an interventional radiologist. We're not worse proceduralists. So they've probably caught on something that I feel like we kind of missed. And so that would be my starting argument for why is ultrasound even important to talk about when it comes to percutaneous renal access. So I'll kind of tell you about where we started from. So this is a picture of me when I was young on that right side when I had lots of hair. Uh, one of my partners here at UCSF, Dr. Marshall Stoller, has been a great mentor to me. If you're a trainee on the line here, you know, I think that in life you have to look for great mentors because they create opportunities for you. And this was at one of the World Congresses uh, of Endourology. This is a bunch of years ago now in New Orleans. And there's a gentleman right here in the middle. His name is Jiang Xing Li from Beijing. And these are a couple of folks uh, who then worked for Bard, uh, which has now become BD Bard because they got bought out. And so I, I make one comment here, which is that, you know, there, there's lots of opportunities to find people in the world to collaborate with. And when you step outside of your box to talk to other folks and learn how they do things, 
those are when kind of some neat ideas can happen. And I think nowadays there's also opportunity to, to collaborate with industry that opens doors to different things. Like this was an opportunity where I actually, I happen to be ethnically Chinese. And so um, there was this gentleman who was here from Beijing and he didn't speak very much English. And so Rebecca, who's there on the left side, uh, who worked for Bard was like, well, maybe let's just put them in the same room because they both speak the same language. And we just sat down and started talking about, well, what do you do? What do we do? What kind of research could we do together? And so after that uh, meeting, I had the opportunity to go and visit him in Beijing. And here, he kind of showed me that he does ultrasound guided access. And so you can see that he's got this really old ultrasound machine. I and mean, that thing was probably built in the 1970s. And this is an unedited video in like four seconds, he's in the kidney and there's urine coming out there. And I went to China and I came back and I said, okay, my life is complete. I've seen a unicorn. We're done here, but I could never do that. But it really kind of stuck with me, that image. And he was very kind enough to kind of share that video. And uh, I came back and it was just like, well, let's try to learn surgery by YouTube. So I'm just gonna watch that video and copy his moves. And you can see I've got a much nicer ultrasound machine. And you can see the kidney on the background there. I put my kidney in, my needle in. And this is unedited video for me after six cases. And so after six cases of just watching his video and copying his moves, I was able to actually put a needle into a kidney. And that was the aha moment that for me, I said to myself, okay, we're missing the boat here. I think that if most people in the world are using ultrasound to get in the kidney and people can do this and they are urologists, this is the training we need to really be thinking about. And so now that we've been doing this for a few years, we've kind of developed a system for teaching and we're teaching it to our trainees, to our residents, to our fellows. Uh, and we've boiled it down to really just two skills for you to be able to actually achieve what you just saw. The first skill is about imaging. So in the United States, uh, in most of the Western world, we don't do enough teaching of renal ultrasounding. But the first skill is really, how can you figure out how to get a good picture of the kidney onto your uh, ultrasound screen? So this is me in the operating room. I've got an assistant here injecting a little bit of fluid into the kidney to induce hydronephrosis. I'm holding the probe here against the patient's flank. And this is a picture of the kidney. So this is kind of that bean-shaped kidney. This is the parenchyma, that's that darker gray color. The lighter gray is hyalur fat here. The black is collecting system. And this white thing with a shadow is our stone. So if you can consistently get this picture onto your screen, that is the first step. If you can achieve that, you can do what we just showed you. As opposed to fluoroscopy, there's a lot of advantages here for imaging for kidneys. So this is kind of a typical retrograde polygram. So you can see we've retrograde injected the collecting system. It's a fairly simple system, upper pole, mid kidney, lower pole. And then we have this debate, you know, which one's the posterior calyx? Do I stick my needle into this one or that one for lower pole, into this calyx or that calyx for an upper pole? We debate about this. And that's for a kind of a simple case, right? Whereas here's a complicated case where this whole collecting system looks like, you know, the, the antlers off of a, of a moose or something like that. So I don't even know what's front and what's back. It's hardly even to tell like what's upper pole and mid kidney. So on a complex case, it becomes even more difficult for us to use fluoroscopy to get in the kidney. So we've got all sorts of ways to try to figure that out. So, you know, the way that we teach it, you line the kidney up, you put your needle right on top, and then uh, you stick your needle in, and then we rotate the C-arm towards us so we can judge our depth. So that's kind of an idea of triangulation. And then if your needle comes away from the kidney, you know you're either too deep or too superficial, so you try again. And the challenge here is that to get into the right calyx, and I've got to emphasize this point, the right calyx is the posterior calyx from the prone position. So the posterior calyx, the right place to get a beautiful case done with perfect access, is really hard to figure out with fluoroscopy because we spend all this time making a two-dimensional x-ray image into a three-dimensional object in our heads. And that's a lot of mental gymnastics as opposed to ultrasound. So this is the picture I was showing you before. This is that kidney. So here's the kidney. Here's the meat, here's the hyalur fat, and here's the collecting system, here's the stone. If this patient is prone, lying flat, if the calyx is towards the top of the kidney, so this is a calyx here, this is a calyx here, there's a calyx back here, whatever's at the top is posterior by definition. So ultrasound really is what you see is what you get. So if you can get that image on there, everything towards the top is posterior, 
that's what you stick your needle into. So there's no more mental gymnastics about figuring out how deep you are anymore. How do we do it? So this is our typical San Franciscan patient. They've been dieting and exercising for a long time. So we've laid them prone in this position. And we have the 12th, 11th, and 10th ribs marked out. And here's the uh, lateral border of the paraspinous muscle and the anterior superior leg crest. So those are our typical landmarks. To find the kidney, I think about those landmarks. I'll mark them out, especially if we're teaching from the first time for residents and trainees. And then I just say, let's just stick the probe on parallel to the paraspinous muscle to try to find where the kidney is. The initial thing that happens most often is that you stick it on there and you're just gonna to go to the soft spot. That's like Pettit's triangle. So you're gonna stick in the soft spot. It's usually too inferior and too lateral to find the kidney. So if you stick your probe on, you can't find the kidney, go more medial, go more superior, and you're gonna find it there. Once you find it, those ribs will be cross-cutting your ultrasound image so the next move is to be, once you find your kidney, you scan through it, identify all the anatomy, then you're gonna turn your probe, rotating it so it's parallel to the ribs to get rid of those rib shadows. So I'll show you how that looks. In the operating room, I use saline, so no gel, so it doesn't make your fingers all uh, gooey, so it's easier to handle things. This is a supine position, but it's the same concepts. I've got the paraspinous muscle there, and then the ribs and the hip. A 3.5 megahertz probe, it's a standard abdominal probe, everybody's got one, is the type of probe that you wanna use. And I stick it against the body, parallel to the body axis, I'm gonna find the kidney there, I'm gonna orient my probe, so if I press the foot side of the patient, it's gonna move the right side of the screen, in this case it moved the left, so I flip my probe 180. I'm gonna find my kidney, that you can see here, and now there's a rib shadow there, and so I'm gonna rotate my probe, so now you can see it's parallel to the ribs, to get this beautiful shot of the kidney. That's the kidney there. Here's the gray of the meat. Here's the black of the collecting system. Calyx here. That's the one you're gonna hit because it's the closest to the top. There's probably some calyces a little bit further back uh, towards the bottom here and here. But if you can find that picture of the kidney, find the fat, find the collecting system, that's what it takes to do this. So that's it, there's no secret. If you can achieve that consistently, just find the kidney, get a beautiful picture of the kidney, you can do this. Here are some things that you might be able to see. So what you're seeing here is called a plural sliding side, uh, plural sliding sign. This bright white thing that's coming in from the right side of the screen, so the head side of the patient, every time the patient takes a breath, you see it sliding in there. If it's bright and white and sparkly, it's probably pleura, there's probably lung by there, so don't stick a needle into it. This is a picture of bowel. So um, what you're gonna see here is, there's sparkly moving stuff down here on the right side of the screen. Here's the kidney here, and on the right side of the screen, sparkly moving stuff. That's bowel, so don't stick a needle into it. And this is the liver, and this is the spleen. I know that because the liver is a little bit hyperechoic compared to the echogenicity of the spleen. It's got a more triangular shape, and this is more uh, the same echogenicity of the kidney. I have no idea. I'm not a radiologist. I actually don't have any clear understanding of what it takes to understand what's the liver and what's the spleen in. But if I see a big triangular thing on top of the kidney, that looks bad, so don't stick a needle into it. As opposed to all those things on an x-ray, this is what they look like. The bowel, the liver, the spleen, the lungs, virtually invisible. And so hopefully that's a convincing argument that there's also some safety margin that ultrasound introduces to you because you can see some things that you don't want to stick a needle into. And people have published on that and shown that maybe you can decrease your complication rates for renal access. So that's the entire first skill. If you can image consistently and then see the kidney, that's what it takes. The second skill is the one that most people worry about, but this is the one that I actually think that people can achieve uh, relatively quickly if they're good imagers. And that's controlling the needle. So the goal here is I'm holding now the probe, I'm a right-handed surgeon, so I'm holding the probe with my non-dominant left hand and I'm holding the needle with my dominant right hand. Here's a picture of the kidney here. So here's the kidney capsule, here's the meat, here's the fat, and this is the collecting system. This bright line, that's the needle. So if I can see that needle entering into the collecting system the whole way down, that's the second skill. How do we get there? So the hand position is really important. So I use the non-dominant hand to hold the probe and my dominant hand, for me, my right hand, to hold the needle. And that's how I'm gonna control the needle. 
you can bring it in from the top side of the probe, from the bottom side of the probe, from the side of the probe. We generally teach what I call the longitudinal needle insertion, and we published in the Journal of Endurology a while ago. The reason for that is if you hold the probe kind of parallel to the long axis of the kidney, you see a nice, beautiful shot of the kidney in its entirety. So you can see the collecting system, the calyces, and when you bring the needle in from either the top or the bottom, you can see the entire needle length. And that way you feel nice and confident that I'm not hitting anything bad as I bring the needle in. So that's why we teach that longitudinal needle insertion. The trick here is that it's hard sometimes when you're getting started to keep it in that imaging plane. Because as you imagine, the ultrasound probe here, as it looks at that kidney, it just gives you one slice of the kidney in one imaging plane. So you have to keep that kidney uh, still, and you have to keep the needle in that imaging plane and not move it out of the plane, if that makes sense. So we teach it by using a couple of different models. So this is one of the abdominal phantom models we use for train our residents and our fellows. So these big bright white spots are targets, and this is the needle. So one way to find your needle is I'm holding my needle very still, and then I'm moving my probe back and forth to find where my needle is, then I'm moving it back to the imaging plane that contains the target, and then I move my needle over and bring it forward in the target plane. So I initially move my probe and then I move my needle. The other way to do it is hold your probe very still on the target plane and now I'm bouncing my needle in and out of the targeting plane until it gets super bright, that's the tip of the needle, and then when I'm in that plane I advance it forward as I'm seeing the entire length of the needle. So the second technique is move the needle, not your imaging hand. But the overall concept here is don't move both your hands at once, otherwise you'll get disoriented. So move one hand at a time in order to kind of keep your image on that needle. And now that we've been doing this for a long time, uh, when you line up ultrasound versus fluoroscopy, so I started off as a fluoroscopy trained uh, resident here at UCSF. Uh, I think I had terrific training. Um, we did fluoro for the entire thing. And I did my fellowship here, so I kind of, you know, sharpened those skills. And so I felt very comfortable with fluoroscopy access. I've switched over completely now to ultrasound. And so I'm doing like 97% of my cases totally x-ray free, ultrasound tip to tail. Now that we've been doing that for a while, uh, there's some things I think are, are better with ultrasound um, compared to fluoroscopy. Hopefully I've convinced you by now that selection of the posterior calyx, so figuring out where you want to stick your needle in the right calyx to get the perfect puncture, I think that's a little bit easier with ultrasound. Your ability to visualize perirenal structures like the liver, the spleen, the lung, the bowel, that's all I think easier with ultrasound. We've published that there's some savings in expense and obvious savings in radiation exposure. Uh, and you know those are fairly obvious. Uh, and I'll show you some of that data and how that might impact your practice uh, or your system's practice. The most compelling argument though for ultrasound to me has been the learning curve. So you know people have published all over the place for years and years that if you do fluoroscopy access, one in 10 urologists, that includes endourology trained, uh, fellowship trained urologists, get their own access. And then 90% of everybody else just has IR do it. And so for the patient, you gotta split it into two procedures, you gotta coordinate with IR, it's not so great for patients. That's one in 10. Whereas I think with the learning curve with ultrasound, hopefully I'll convince you that you can get there faster and more people can get their own access, which is better for the system, it's better for patients, uh, and it's better for outcomes. People have published that if you look at fluoroscopy, it takes easily 60 cases for you to achieve competence. And our, our residents are, we're a very busy endurology practice. We do somewhere between 300 to 400 PCLs a year. And uh, our residents will probably graduate with somewhere between 30 and 50 PCNL cases under their belt. People have published that it takes a good 60 to have competence on renal access. And some have published as many as 120 in order for you to actually feel very comfortable to get your own access. That's a big learning curve. As opposed to now, this is me coming back from China, and this is like, you know, Tom Chi learning how to do surgery on YouTube, because I'm just watching a video, I didn't really have a teacher. And it took me about 20 cases to reach an inflection point where I was consistently getting into the kidney. And so my success took about 20 cases. So that, that was a learning curve for a relatively um, trained urologist learning on their own. And you can see at the first part of the learning curve, I was quite bad, right? So I 
missed. And by, by success, I mean, did I stick a needle in to a place that I could use for the surgery itself? And so uh, it took about 20 days to get to that confidence. Now that we've been doing it the same exact way that I've shown you now in the last couple minutes, in terms of how we train our trainees, this is kind of a typical PGY success failure learning curve uh, for a PGY4. And uh, actually Yi, who's the moderator here, was, was probably part of this, uh, this sample size. And when you look at it here, proficiency can be gained by about six cases. And so, you know, I spend some of my time at the county hospital and then uh, some of my time at the university hospital. And at the county, we do try to give a little bit more autonomy to the residents. Back in the fluoro days, I mean, I'm scrubbing in tip to tail and I'm helping them get the access the whole time. Most of our chief residents, by the time they actually get to their county rotation, I'm standing in the corner and kind of offering some tips and they're doing the whole case tip to tail. So I've seen that shift over time. So that to me is the most compelling reason why I think ultrasound really is a strong strategy for renal access. People have talked about use of a guide. And so just like for transrectal ultrasound biopsies, you can get a probe guide for renal, uh, renal access. These are the type of uh, probe guides that are out there. There are many different styles. There's one that's matched to pretty much every manufacturer of a probe, and people use them now for renal biopsies. And so if you think about the two learning curve skills that I just went over, imaging, needle control, if you use a needle guide, you can kind of take out that second skill and just focus on imaging. So it's a nice way to kind of get yourself started, introduce a little bit of confidence if you want to then move to freehand later. So there is some advantage to doing that. So hopefully I've convinced you by now that renal access is achievable by anybody on the Zoom call, anybody in this conference, really anybody in the world, and that there are these two skills that if you can learn and master, you can get to that point where you can get renal access yourself for your cases, for your patients. So um, looking at the time, I think we got some time, so I'll talk about the rest of the procedure now, because you know, okay, you've got beautiful access, you're in the kidney, now what do I do? It's very reasonable, once you have your needle in under ultrasound to switch over to fluoro, you will have saved yourself a lot of headache of coordinating getting somebody else to get your access. So you've got perfect access. You'll save yourself a bunch of radiation exposure because you didn't use it during your access part. Uh, and it's very safe because all the concepts of dilation under uh, fluoroscopy would still pretty much hold true. You can do this under ultrasound guidance. As I mentioned before, that's about 97% of all my cases now. So I come in, I don't even wear lead. So usually like the resident like me is gonna look over and be like, is Tom, she wearing lead? And if I'm not wearing lead, they don't put on lead. And it's a great day. And nobody has to kind of sweat or their thick lead all day. And this is what it looked like with Dr. Lee. So I went there and I was like, okay, well show me the rest of the procedure. And so he's using a shorter needle than we have here, a shorter wire than we have available in the United States. It kind of, you know, it's just long enough to go over your shoulder. And he's got a dilator that he's putting on and he's pushing the dilator down and he's advancing it just into the collecting system and it's perfect every time. Hopefully by now you're thinking to yourself, where's the fluoro machine? Where's the ultrasound machine? How the heck is he doing that? He's feeling the vibration of the wire as it goes down. It's kind of like playing the arhu. It's like playing a, like a cello, you know? He feels the vibration of the wire, and as soon as the, the, the wire vibrates a little bit, he knows he's getting just to the tip of the wire where it's bending in the collecting system, and then he stops. This is a true master. He does, he's done uh, somewhere around 22,000 PCMLs, and there's lots of people who are like, oh yeah, I've done 5,000, I've done 10,000. This guy's truly done 22,000. I've been to his operating room where he's done, um, I think the most he ever did was like 27 cases in a day. I mean, he, he has a system and he's a machine. We can't teach this safely. I mean, for us, he is the blind samurai. He is the blind samurai who is a master and everybody knows him. For us, it would look like blind squirrels. I mean, that, that's just not something we can teach. So the rest of the time that we've kind of been developing this ultrasound system, we've kind of spent ways to, we've tried to invest ways and figure out, well, how can we use ultrasound, adapt our fluoroscopy instruments to do the whole thing under ultrasound guidance, under imaging guidance, so that it's safe for our, our patients and safe for surgeons who aren't doing 20,000 plus cases in their lifetimes. And so I'll walk you through that within the remainder of our time. So this is what things look like under ultrasound. So now I've got my probe here, I've got my wire here, and I'm holding on the wire. The wire looks very bright 
under ultrasound signal because it's a wire that's wrapped in uh, metal usually and it bounces off the ultrasound um, uh, waves and so it's very easy to see. The dilator on the other hand is usually made of polyurethane or some type of plastic -y material and it is invisible to ultrasound because the ultrasound waves don't bounce off it, it just passes right through. So when you put an ultrasound probe on and you advance a dilator like we're typically used to, the dilator will obscure the wire in the part that it's covering up. And so the place where the wire is apparent to your eye, that's the tip of the dilator. So it's a bit of a reverse from what we're used to because most of these dilators were designed for fluoroscopy. So we're used to looking for the tip as it advances under a fluoro. But here, you're looking for the wire to disappear to tell you where the dilator is. So it's a bit of a reverse in the way that you use your imaging, but you can do this fairly consistently. We use a balloon, so this is a barred X-Force balloon. That's my typical, only because it goes to 30 atmospheres of pressure. And uh, you, you wanna try to be able to get through the fascia and you know, we do a lot of redo cases so that difference between 20 atmospheres and 30 atmospheres makes a bit of a difference for us. Um, but any balloon will do, it'll show you a similar image. The tip of the balloon, uh, you can see usually as a bright spot as you advance it. And then once you inflate it, I just use saline. Once you inflate it with saline, then it becomes very obvious. But you really want to make sure that your tip is in the right location before you blow it up. Because once you blow up the balloon, you're kind of committed to what you have already. I'll show you what that looks like. So here, I've got my ultrasound on. You can see my wire coming in from the right side of the screen. And it's a really bright signal. I use this one-handed technique to back the needle off. There's the wire there. And uh, you can see now that we have the wire in place in the collecting system. And now I'm advancing my dilator down. Here's the wire that's super bright. As the dilator comes down, you can see it's obscuring the bright wire signal. Now the wire's disappeared. So as I back up the dilator, you can see the wire reappearing. So that interface between the wire and not seeing the wire, that's the tip of the dilator. And now my balloon's coming down, and what you're gonna see is this kind of bright thing sliding over. And you know, to be honest, it's a little bit harder to see. That's the tip of the balloon right there, that little bright white dot. And once you've got the tip of that balloon right inside the collecting system, then you know you're perfectly positioned. And you know, I'll be totally honest here, this takes a little bit of practice to be able to get to. So probably access six cases, probably to get the dilation, like Yi right now is doing dilation. He's doing a great job. Uh, that's probably more like 20 cases to be able to feel like, okay, I could maybe do this on my own. So it is a steeper learning curve to do this part. And once you put the balloon up, you can see the balloon blown up. So that's kind of what the dilation looks like. And then the rest of the case kind of goes the same in terms of your lithotripsy and removal of stones. A couple of tips and tricks that we've come to over the years that have helped folks. So uh, if you're not familiar with using ultrasound on a consistent basis, there's lots of buttons on the ultrasound consoles that change lots of advanced things that radiologists and technicians are familiar with that I don't really even understand. I generally just touch a couple of things. One is depth. So most have a knob or a, or a lever that adjusts depth. I just wanna make the kidney big enough that it fills up the screen, but not so big that it's cut off. The second is gain, and that's really how bright is your picture on the screen. So you've got these gain levers here and also a knob that usually controls the overall brightness. You can control the depth of each level. You'll see here as I slide that over at the bottom, that gets dark and then bright. And you just want it to be bright enough to see the whole kidney. That rotation of the probe is really critical. So this is a prone patient. I'm rotating the probe now to get rid of the rib shadow so I can see there's a rib shadow there. And now that I'm parallel to the ribs, I can see the beautiful kidney all without any rib shadowing in place. That's really critical. For calyx seal positioning, I bring the calyx I wanna stick a needle into to one side of the screen or the other. So in this case, if I wanted to put a needle in on the head side of the probe, that's the left side of the screen, I'm gonna bring my target calyx here close to the left side of the screen to shorten the distance of my needle's gotta travel. And if it's a lower pole, I'm gonna go from the bottom side, I'm gonna slide that probe forward to bring the kidney and my calyx of interest over to the right side of the screen. So that way, if I stick my needle in, I'll shorten that distance from behind the probe. So bringing the target to one side of the screen or another gets you a nice working angle, so you're not too close to the skin, and also a shortened distance. Now when the wire goes in, you shouldn't use a hydrophilic wire because they're a little bit invisible because they don't have any, um, they don't have any contour or edge so that uh, ultrasound passes right through it. 
but you ought to be able to see the wire really well. I'll jiggle my wire so that I can actually see where the tip is. And once I'm in, I use this one-handed technique to pull out my needle, and then I use my offhand to hold my wire in place. So people oftentimes ask me, well, okay, fine, Tom, you've got like a resin of fellow and all these people helping you, but how do you do it by yourself? That one-handed technique is critical. I put a five French up in most every case, and I connect it to some fluid that's hooked up to like IV fluid or CISO tubing, and it goes to a bag, and it's just dripping. So I do that at the front end. So by the time I'm positioned and ready to go, pretty much everybody has moderate hydronephrosis. You don't need to do that, but what I found was that when I didn't do it, the residents had a little bit of a harder time getting in. So now I do it pretty much every case to increase your success rate. We published a video on uh, video urology a long time ago that kind of goes over all these things. So feel free to use that as a resource for yourself and obviously reach out to us. And I'll spend just a couple minutes talking about, you know, how do we transition? So I'm used to fluoroscopy. How do I move to ultrasound? So I think that one of the keys, like everything, is practice. You know, that 10,000 hours uh, starts somewhere, but you can't do it all in one case. You know, if you like did a case and you're like, okay, I'm going to try ultrasound today and you say to the anesthesiologist, I'm going to use 10,000 hours right now. The library's going to be mad at you, right? So I just made the rule for myself. I'm going to do five minutes on every case. So whatever I can do in five minutes, I'm going to do. So at the beginning, it was all I could do to just figure out where to put the ultrasound probe in five minutes, and then I moved on. I don't want them to make the resident mad because you know they don't want to. I don't want them to feel like I'm taking the case away from them. So five minutes seemed like a good compromise. Nobody got mad. Nurses didn't get mad. Anesthesiologists didn't get mad. We didn't endanger the patient. And I practiced outside of the operating room too. So you know every patient that came to my clinic, I had set up an ultrasound machine. So when they came in, they had like you know I'm here for scrotal pain. I'd say oh you know I'm kind of worried about your kidneys. Why don't we even take a look at your kidneys? And they were very happy. They're like oh Tom she really cares about me. And I'm just like imaging their kidneys so I can practice. And I'd be like oh you know why don't you lie on your tummy? And so, uh, you know, because I, I like to do it in the prone position. And so I'm looking at the patients, but I'm also imaging. So the more imaging you do, the easier your learning curve will be in the operating room. I think at the beginning, too, if you're used to fluoro, make sure that you have your backup ready to go. So if your backup is fluoroscopy, make sure your fluoro machine's in there. I know it's an extra piece of equipment, but you got to be able to kind of progress through the case so that you don't, uh, you don't find yourself kind of uh, stuck with only an ultrasound machine. So I prepared each of my cases with that intent for fluoroscopy. So if I had problems, I'd get myself out of trouble with my flora machine. And one really critical thing is, you know, I think people will see a lecture like this oftentimes. So I, I've talked to lots of people from around the world about ultrasound. And a lot of times I'll get feedback. This is, oh, I tried it, Tom. You're, you're total, it's a total disaster. Like you can't do this, it's impossible. And I'm like, okay, well, what kind of patient is it? Well, you know, their BMI was 60 and they had a full staghorn stone, but you know, it, it should have been easy. That's not the case to start with. Start with the easy case, smaller stone burden, no staghorn stone, moderate hydronephrosis, smaller patient. All those things make a huge difference to get yourself confidence and a good learning curve so you can actually bring yourself in a position where you can do this consistently. When you're doing fluoro, so I mentioned to you like everything is almost the same in terms of your dilation. Ultrasound will put you in a calyces that you may have never actually seen or paid attention to a fluoroscopy. So this is an example. I use ultrasound to get into an upper pole calyx, and it looks like I'm in the right in the middle of an infundibulum on a fairly collecting, a simple collecting system. And so I bailed out in a lot of these cases before I realized if you look really closely here at this dark spot right in the middle of the upper pole, there is a posterior facing calyx there that we never notice or talk about with fluoroscopy. Because people talk about medial lateral in the upper pole, but never about posterior. But it turns out there's lots of calyces that actually are great targets with ultrasound, get the job done, that we just never notice in their fluoro. So be prepared that your imaging under ultrasound, your imaging under fluoro is going to be a little bit non, uh, it'll be a little bit disjointed. So they won't look exactly the same. And when you feel confident about your imaging, it's probably okay to use your ultrasound imaging to guide yourself. I mentioned before that the learning curve is about 20 cases if you're not even learning from anybody. Six cases if you've got a good learning system, a good teacher in place. If you go with the higher BMI patient, we've shown that that learning curve shifts. So below 30, you've got kind of a standard looking BMI, 30 to 40, a uh, standard looking learning curve. BMI 30 to 40, maybe it's a little bit harder, but you can see for the patients that have a BMI above 40, it takes you easily 100 cases to really kind of know what you're doing there. So as I mentioned before, when you're starting out, don't jump straight to that biggest patient you can find. Start with the easiest case, you'll build your confidence, you'll build your skill set. 
we've shown that there's about a 30% cost reduction when it comes to ultrasound versus fluoroscopy. A lot of that has to do with, you know, you can get a fine image with an ultrasound machine that costs about $30,000. So there's lots of machines with bells and whistles on it, but you can do a pretty good job with a pretty cost effective machine. And especially if it's a machine that can be shared among services, you can save a lot of money there. And you know, one of the things I think is very appealing about this approach is that there's a radiation exposure savings that happens right up front. So this is kind of a mixture of that learning curve paper uh, looking at radiation exposure. So this was me, how much fluoro uh, radiation exposure I used when I was doing all cases with fluoro. And this is the first 100 cases. I just divided them up into the first, uh, second, and third third of those first 100 cases. And you can see, and if you remember that learning curve paper, right, my success in the first 30 was pretty lousy. But despite that, because my ultrasound got my needle into the ballpark, I cut my radiation exposure down by half right away just by trying. And over time, you can get to a point where you can really reduce your radiation exposure, even if you're doing some of these cases with fluoro. And most of these cases were a combination of both fluoro and ultrasound. Maybe you get to the point where you can do this fully fluoro-free. That's achievable. And we've shown that now. We published that if you do it and you can achieve that level of confidence, uh, starting with the easy case, of course, moderate hydro, no staghorn stone present, you can get to a fluoro-free PCNL. We're doing that 97% of the cases, and you can achieve similar outcomes. So similar stone-free rates, similar complication rates, people do great. And uh, from a, this is like stone clearance, and you can see the ultrasound group on the left and the fluoro group on the right side. Uh, no significant difference, both in complications, EBL, stone clearance rates. So you can get there. Uh, the dilation takes a little bit more of a learning curve, but you can get there with persistence and practice. The easiest way to get to a fluoro-free uh, PCNL right now in our current state of technology, in my mind, is using what's called endoscopic combined intrarenal surgery. It's a fancy way to say you put a ureteroscope up from below, you use an ultrasound from the top, you get your access under ultrasound, you see the needle come in, that's what that upper right-hand picture shows, and then you can dilate with direct vision. And that way you wouldn't need to use any fluoro at all. So if you've got the manpower or the person power to do that in the operating room, that's a nice option. So uh, this is a nice paper out of Dwayne Baldwin's group from Loma Linda. And so they show that very nicely with that technique, you can fairly quickly get to a fluoro-free PCNL in your own hands. So hopefully I've convinced you in the time that we've had together that ultrasound, one, it's gaining acceptance worldwide. As I mentioned, you know, 15 years ago, there were only a few people publishing on this. So before we kind of came to the field, there was maybe six to 10 papers on this particular subject. And now when I, when I recently PubMedded, there's uh, over 100 papers talking about ultrasound guided PCNL. I think this is the new next immediate wave. There's immediate benefits to radiation exposure, cost, most importantly for learning curve. I think people can learn this, this is the system, there's no secrets here, this is the system we teach our residents, our fellows, all of our trainees. I think it's kind of changed the face of PCNL and it's continuing to do so all across the United States and the world. If you wanna get there, you know, think about how to use the shorter learning curve to your advantage. So find the easier cases to start with and transition slowly and make sure you have a backup in place. This has been a long time work in progress. We've had some terrific people who've kind of come through both the residency program, the fellowship program that have helped to kind of establish the teaching system we have. We've been fortunate to get funding to support the kind of research that we're doing from the NIDDK, as well as the AUA and the Endurology Societies. We're very grateful for that type of support. The last slide I'm gonna leave up here is that, you know, we, we had actually pitched and gotten accepted a new course that we were calling interventional ultrasonography. You know, how do you use ultrasound to stick a needle into the kidney and do it for all sorts of things? Biopsy, renal access, nephrosity two place. So we were super stoked about that course. It was gonna be this year at the national meeting for the AUA in Washington, D.C. Obviously, for important reasons, the meeting was canceled, but they have told us that we will be uh, coming back for next year's meeting, which will be in Las Vegas. So eventually, that, uh, that, that will be open to registration, so look for it hopefully in the fall or the winter time of this year. The AUA also hosts a wonderful course called Practical PCNL from Access to Exit, and they have one about every quarter all across the United States and then one at the national meeting. And that's the, uh, the course number for the national meeting. That's, uh, that one's directed by Rob Sweet out of University of Washington. It's a wonderful course. They talk about access from all different aspects, but also include ultrasound. And I've also left my email down there and my Twitter handle. So any questions at all, you could always feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to help. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time today. Um, I do have to acknowledge that 
the team here, Kirsty, Michelle, and Lindsay Hampson, who's really spearheaded this whole COVID learning series, have just been wonderful. And to bring the community together in a way that we can virtually learn with each other has been awesome. So I think we've got a few minutes for questions. I'm happy to open it up. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Tom, for a great talk. I was like watching my fourth year endourology experience in an hour replayed. Um, we do have a couple of questions from the audience and certainly welcome anyone else to submit questions through the Q&A. Uh, the first question is, how do you manage rotated kidneys to confirm the posterior calyx? And maybe you could speak more about just difficult anatomy in general uh, when you encounter that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Jason Lee has this terrific talk where he's got these slides of like, here are some of the hard cases I've done. And you've got people who are like twisted off like pretzels. Like you think that oh, the spine couldn't even grow that way. And he's like, oh, no, an ultrasound, no problem. Uh, so th those are not easy cases. So complex anatomy can be hard. I'm going to make the argument that we should probably steer ourselves away from the idea of posterior anterior. Because, you know, when you think about fluoroscopy as an imaging modality, it truly is only intermittent. So you take a fluoro shot, you try to interpret it, you look at it, you kind of rotate the C-arm, you take another shot, you try to interpret it. You do fairly little live imaging. But with ultrasound, you're imaging the whole time. You've got your hand on the probe, you're looking at the kidney, you're trying to figure out your calyces. So it really is what you see is what you get with live imaging there. And with ultrasound, the concept is not to try to figure out what's posterior, what's anterior, but rather get that beautiful picture of the anatomy, pick the calyx that is closest to the top, because that's gonna be the shortest track to get you into the kidney. If you're prone, that'll mostly be a posterior calyx. If you're supine, that might be an anterior calyx. But it doesn't really matter to me, because as long as it's a short track, I can see the collecting system, it's the tip of the calyx, and it's a straight shot to get to the stone, I'm in good shape. So that whole conversation about posterior and anterior becomes a little bit irrelevant with ultrasound. And you can apply that to complex anatomy too. So, you know, we do a fair amount of like spina bifida people. Uh, we do people with kind of um, really bad scoliosis of so spinal deformation. But oftentimes, you know, those abnormalities and the rotation of the kidney will put one portion of the kidney really close to the skin. And so your skin to stone distance actually might be very short in a complex patient. And so with ultrasound, you can see exactly where that tract is. So that's why my argument is that you really have to go to the imaging, because if you can see the anatomy, the ideal shot would be, I can see my uh, kidney, I can see my calyx, and then I can see the stone all in one shot. So I know if I put my needle in right in a straight shot, I wouldn't have to torque my scope very much to actually get to my stone. So those kinds of concepts will support your ability to kind of do complex cases. And um, you can do some pretty complex cases with ultrasound. Great. So we have a few more questions coming in. Um, you kind of mentioned it very briefly, but uh, one uh, viewer want to wants to ask about your experience with supine ultrasound and how you do supine. Yeah, so that's a great question. You know, supine PCNL has been around for a while now. Um, there's been a lot of different types of positioning that have been described, um, modified, Galdico, Valdivia, where you have like legs in the, in the lithotomy position, kind of rotate a little bit, straight supine, propped up a little bit. So there, there's lots of different people who've been talking about supine for a while. A lot of that work comes out of South America. Uh, we probably about three years ago now said, well, you know, why don't we just try supine and everybody just to see what that's all about. The nice thing about ultrasound is that, you know, the concepts that I showed you now here, they apply to any position. So you could do supine, you can do prone, you can do lateral, you can do flank, you can do lazy lithotomy, you can do upside down on your head, any position, the concepts are the same. And so in a supine position now, uh, we, we've stopped doing supine for everybody. Now we just kind of select based on the, the patient and the stone criteria. Uh, but it's the same concept. So find the kidney, get a good image, get rid of your ribs, and then control your needle. The only difference really is that when you go supine, uh, prone to supine or supine to prone, everything flips 180. And so you just want to make sure you don't get disoriented. So when I leave my probe on the body, the, the accepted way to see every image across the world is that the head is on the left of the screen, the feet is on the right. And so if you walked into any radiology suite anywhere in the world and you're just looking at the kidney, you always know the upper poles on the left and the lower poles on the right. When you're actually imaging, 
it feels like you're backwards when you go supine to prone. And so there is a learning curve to kind of use these same concepts, but in a different position. That being said, uh, you know, sometimes in a supine position, you can just flip the probe 180 and if it feels kind of more comfortable to your brain to interpret the image that way, that's very reasonable. But you can use all of these concepts in any position. Just expect there to be a slight learning curve when you do change over. Great. There's a question uh, from the audience about the use of the needle guide. Do you have comments on what the optimal degree is or just needle guides in general? Yeah. So, you know, I, I teach all the residents and fellows uh, freehand. The reason for that is, you know, needle guides right now are limited in the technology in that they generally fix you into one or a few angles. There's a couple of models that allow you to kind of swing it a little bit. But inevitably, if you do a lot of PCNL, you're gonna to get to a case where the needle guide feels like it's a little bit in your way. It's just not the perfect angle that you want, which is why I teach freehand. Because if you can learn what I just showed you and do that consistently, you can always put a needle guide on and then that would make your life way easier. Uh, but if you don't know how to do freehand and you wanna go from the needle guide to freehand because you know the needle guide's kind of in your way, it's a little bit harder to do. So needle guides, I think, are a terrific learning tool because they allow you to separate the imaging skill from the needle control skill and just focus on the imaging skill. So that's very nice. But just keep in mind that at some point they might feel like you're getting in the way. And so you might want to understand those freehand techniques. The needle guides, for the most part, almost every probe manufacturer, every ultrasound company makes their own set of needle guides and they all have their kind of, you know, um, operator characteristics and advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but they all have a similar issue, which is that they're kind of fixed in place. There are a couple of generic needle guides that exist out there that are supposed to be able to be, able to be strapped onto any probe. Um, and some of them are, are more wieldy than others. But needle guide, very nice um, learning curve tool. Uh, but those are the reasons why I teach freehand. We have a question about how you manage transplanted and pelvic kidneys. So this is a this is really an ideal tool for those pelvic kidneys and the transplant kidneys. I mean, one, I think you have to have some type of cross-sectional imaging to make sure you've got a safe window. So especially for the pelvic kidney, if you've got bowel on top, it can be kind of dangerous. Uh, if you've got big blood vessels or aberrant vessels, those are the things you really want to know about ahead of time. You know, clearly the AUA guidelines say that you should do a CT scan on every patient you're thinking about for a PCNL. With an ultrasound, you know, sometimes I don't adhere to that guideline quite 100%, but, you know, I guess that's just between you and me. Um, but I think that for, especially for the pelvic kidney, for the transplant kidney, you want to make sure that you've got a safe window to get to the kidney. That's number one. The concepts that I just showed you, totally the same. And that, that's kind of the similar thing. What you see is what you get. So um, in some ways, a transplant kidney is even easier than what I just showed you in a typical kidney in the normal position because there's no ribs in the way and the skin to stone distance is really short. So if you can get a good image of the kidney, you can find the stone, get a good shot of the calyx, and then put that all in one view, it's kind of like a home run shot. One of the challenges with a transplant kidney is actually that the skin to stone distance is sometimes so short that your needle and your wire and your sheath are liable to fall out. So you want to really pay attention to those things. And for the pelvic kidney, you know, if you've got a good imaging that shows that the pelvic kidney is actually accessible um, percutaneously with an ultrasound machine, as long as you can see that window, you can do all these same things to get the job done. And I, I'd also make the final comment that, you know, fluoroscopy, I've obviously shown you my bias towards ultrasound. But ultrasound, fluoroscopy, they're just tools. And, you know, especially for trainees who are out there, uh, you should try to learn every tool possible because it's going to benefit your patients. And so if I'm in a pelvic kidney and I've used ultrasound to get my access, but I'm like, you know what? I can't really see my wires so well. I don't know if I can dilate this safely. The angle seems a little funky. Oh, yeah, I'll get the fluoro machine out right now. I mean, that's what comprised that 3% of patients that I actually still use fluoroscopy. You just pick the tool that's the safest for your patient and the easiest for you to use. And so um, that, that hopefully is a, a kind of a, I'm going to backpedal and say, you know, fluoroscopy has definitely got its role still. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Chi. That's all the questions we have for now. I thank everyone again for joining us. Please do uh, fill out the survey on the website uh, if you wouldn't mind so that we can continue to improve and, and keep the series going. But uh, thank you again, Dr. Chi, for a great talk. Thanks for everybody's engagement and I appreciate your organization. Great job team.